Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. HDR is becoming increasingly common, yet when you try to find out what it is, things can get complicated real fast. Do a quick search and you get dunked on by a bucket load of jargon. EOTF, Hybrid Lock Gamma, Perceptual Quantizer, Rec 2100, HDR10 Display, HDR, and the list keeps going. Which is why today I'm going to explain what HDR is as simply as possible. And to help with the explanation, I've got here one of the highest end HDR monitors from ASUS. It's the ProArt PA32 UCG. I'll also be talking about whether or not you actually need an HDR monitor. Now, when we're talking about HDR video, it's a completely different thing from HDR in stills photography. That's a whole different technique that works by combining multiple exposures. If that is what you're interested in, there is an excellent 32 minute class on just that from our sponsor Skillshare. It's called Intro to HDR Photography, Shooting and Editing High Dynamic Range, taught by fine art photographer Matt Seuss. I love how he leaves in his creative process, which really helps walk you through how to find a scene that will make for a great HDR photo. But when it comes to classes like this, Skillshare is really a bit of a candy store for topics. You can find classes on film and video, all the way to topics like marketing. Skillshare has been supporting this channel for quite a while now, and for our creative and curious selves, they are an online community home to thousands of inspiring classes. It's built around learning and exploring new skills, deepening existing passions, and for us to just get lost in creativity. With the annual subscription, it costs less than $10 a month, and being curated specifically for learning means there are no ads on the platform so you can stay focused. They're constantly launching new premium classes and the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. So what's the deal with HDR video? Say you've got a scene with something in it that's really bright. Even though your camera might be good enough to capture the full range of brightness in that scene, an average screen might not be able to display that bright spot as brightly as it is in real life. So what happens then is you compress the bright bits by making it darker so the screen can show it without it blowing out and losing detail. This is known as standard dynamic range or SDR. Now in the world of high dynamic range video, the goal is to simply display all that bright stuff without making them darker to fit on the screen, or at least not so much darker until it doesn't look all that bright anymore. You see, even if it were technically feasible, I don't think it would be a good idea to display the true brightness of the sun on your screen. That being said, shouldn't HDR technology be fairly easy? You just make the screens brighter. Well, yes, but when you turn up the brightness on a display, it brings up the dark bits as well, making things that should appear dark look kind of glowy and gray instead. So the art of HDR displays is to make the bright stuff brighter without messing up the dark bits. This is accomplished using display technology like OLED and mini LEDs, OLED's quite common in mobile displays. Every pixel emits its own light and it can turn itself completely off. Mini LED, on the other hand, uses a technique called local dimming. This Pro Art monitor here is using that technology. For this particular screen, the display area is divided into 1,152 zones. And when content appears in any zone that needs to be particularly bright, it increases the brightness of only the LEDs backlighting that zone. For the zones displaying darker content, it can dim the LEDs in those zones to make it darker, or even turn it off completely to display a true black. Now, because each of these zones are much bigger than individual pixels, in specifically high contrast scenes, you can notice a bit of a halo around the bright bits. That's not really a defect, that's just a trait of mini LED. OLED screens do not suffer from this because they are individually controlled at the pixel level. However, OLED screens are also more likely to suffer from burn-in, and they're typically not as bright as mini LEDs, or they cannot sustain that brightness for as long as mini LEDs can. I hope this also addresses two common misconceptions about HDR. The brightness ceiling is increased to make room for displaying bright elements and not to make everything brighter in general. That would be rather painful to look at. Think maximum screen brightness when looking at your phone in the middle of the night. Also, HDR doesn't actually reveal any extra detail in the shadows. There's simply no extra shadow information being encoded in an HDR signal, so technically speaking, you don't really get deeper blacks. What you do get with most HDR displays is the capability of displaying that information at very low luminance levels. So now let's talk about the really confusing stuff. What's the difference between HDR10, Dolby Vision, Display HDR, and all the weird HDR-related terms? Let's start with REC 2100. Its full name is ITU Recommendation BT2100. We'll stick with REC 2100. 
It's basically the standard that defines HDR. You can think of it metaphorically as the HDR constitution. It's a standardization published by the ITU, which is short for International Telecommunication Union. They are actually an agency under the United Nations, so this is the top level standardization. Unfortunately, there is no short answer for what REC 2100 is because it's not one single thing. It's made up of a combination of things. It details the technical limits for HDR video, resolutions, frame rates, a color space, viewing environments, and most importantly for HDR, two options of transfer functions. These two transfer functions are HLG and PQ. But before we get to that, let's first sort out what on earth is a transfer function. Now, when you film something with a digital camera, your camera uses a transfer function to translate real life brightness units into a data value, essentially a number that it saves. This translation is called an OETF, Opto Electronic Transfer Function. The same real life brightness can actually get saved as different data values depending on the different OETF being applied. The inverse happens at your screen. It reads a data value and uses a transfer function to determine how bright each pixel should be displayed on the screen. This is called an EOTF, electro-optical transfer function. The HLG transfer function looks something like this. HLG stands for hybrid log gamma. It's called hybrid log gamma because this part of the function is a logarithmic curve and this part is based on something called a gamma curve. So log and gamma. Now HLG compresses the highlight so we can fit more of it into the signal. The neat thing about this is you can show that compressed signal as is on an SDR system and it will look just fine. I'm showing you an HLG clip in SDR right now. It looks like a log profile that's only log in the highlights, so shadows and midtones still look reasonably contrasty. This is what everybody means when they say HLG is backwards compatible with SDR. Now on an HDR system, the HDR display, if it's compatible with it, detects that it's receiving an HLG signal. It will then apply the correct EOTF to expand those compressed highlights back into their blinding HDR brightness values. PQ, on the other hand, works a bit differently. PQ stands for Perceptual Quantizer, and if you think that's a weird name, wait till you find out its other name. It's also known as ST2084. ST2084, we'll stick with PQ, is special because it handles brightness in absolute values, meaning every data value represents a specific amount of brightness in real life. It's like the PQ signal is telling your monitor, I don't care what you feel like doing, make sure this shows up as exactly 100 nits. Now this screen here can go up to a maximum of 1600 nits. What if a signal comes in telling it to do 4000 nits? Well, for one, it's not gonna blow up. The monitor would typically give you options to either ignore everything beyond what it can display and just display that as pure white, otherwise known as signal clipping, or gently bring the overrange information down into its capabilities so you preserve detail in the highlights. So because it gives off absolute values, PQ is great for making sure the content shows up as close to the original as possible, which is why formats like HDR10 and most of Dolby Vision use PQ. And there's more terms again. Now, Dolby Vision and HDR10 are formats. These are just two of the many formats that exist for HDR video, and in a sense, these formats are kind of like their own sets of standards. But hold up. I thought REC 2100 was the standard. Well, yes, think of REC 2100 as the grand standard, and these formats are little subgroups that exist within the boundaries of REC 2100. Each format would also contain their own proprietary metadata. These are used during playback to adjust the image depending on the conditions of the display. For example, instructions for SDR down conversion or remapping the values to fit a display's peak brightness. In essence, these formats are supposed to simplify HDR compatibility from source to playback. Devices are made with support for specific formats, and when content is delivered in one of those formats, it provides a degree of assurance that the content will appear correctly on that device, or at least to the best of the device's capabilities. Display HDR, however, is not one of these formats. In fact, it's not a format at all. It's a certification. Think a seal of approval for how good an HDR display is. A rating system, in essence. There's different levels of this certification, with each level having a set of increasingly demanding criteria a display must achieve in order to deserve it. 
This ASUS monitor here meets the Display HDR 1400 certification, meaning it meets and in our case even slightly outperforms the specs required by Display HDR 1400, which is actually a very high score among HDR displays. So this system actually helps us in a way by simply glancing at the Display HDR score, you already get a rough idea of how good the HDR performance of that monitor is. That's all being said, do you really need one of these? Well, beginning with the obvious, if you want to consume content in true HDR, you're going to need a display that can show it. If it's purely for entertainment, however, a ProWatt monitor is probably going to be extremely overkill. These are made to be as accurate as possible to be used as reference displays for creating content in HDR. HDR TVs or HDR gaming monitors are probably a better choice if it's solely for content consumption. But that's not to say HDR movies don't look absolutely breathtaking on this thing. But if you're a creative who wants to deliver content in HDR, then you will need to see what your work looks like. You will need an accurate HDR monitor for content mastering. But throughout the course of producing this video, I learned that HDR monitors are also actually equally essential for the process of learning how to do HDR. I've had access to cameras that can shoot in HDR for years, but because I never had an HDR monitor, I couldn't experiment or practice delivering what I shot in true HDR. I could study up on as much theory as I want, but the visual memory simply did not exist. I didn't know how to grade it, I didn't know how to expose it, because I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. So for me, the biggest reason to get an HDR monitor is to think of it as your ticket into the world of HDR. One would argue that HDR was incredibly niche just not too long ago, but as of recent, it's actually made its way extremely quickly into the mass market. Consider recent devices like the iPhone 12s and iPad Pro with mini LED, it really shouldn't be long before consumers are used to receiving content in HDR. So if you found this video helpful, it would help me a lot if you share it with your friends. Huge thanks to ASUS for lending me this incredible monitor. Way too bad I don't get to keep it though, but if you'd like to see more from me, here's a few other videos to check out. Thank <laughs> you.